Kiran Bedi born the 9th of June 1949, is a retired Indian police service officer, social activist, former tennis player and politician who is the current Lieutenant Governor of Puducherry. She is the first woman to join the Indian Police Service IPS. She remained in service for 35 years before taking voluntary retirement in 2007 as Director General, Bureau of Police Research and Development. As a teenager, Betty became the national junior tennis champion in 1966. Between 1965 and 1978, she won several titles at national and state level championships. After joining IPS, Betty served in Delhi, Goa, Chandigarh and Mizoram. She started her career as an assistant superintendent of police in Chanakyapuri area of Delhi, and won the President's Police Medal in 1979. Next, she moved to West Delhi, where she brought a reduction in crimes against women. Subsequently, as a traffic police officer, she oversaw traffic arrangements for the 1982 Asian Games in Delhi and the 1983 CHOGM meet in Goa. As DCP of North Delhi, she launched a campaign against drug abuse, which evolved into the Navjoti Delhi Police Foundation renamed to Navjoti India Foundation in 2007. In May 1993, she was posted to the Delhi prisons as Inspector General IG. She introduced several reforms at Tihar Jail, which gained worldwide acclaim and won her the Ramon Magsaysay Award in 1994. In 2003, Betty became the first Indian woman to be appointed as a police advisor to Secretary General of the United Nations, in the Department of Peacekeeping Operations. She resigned in 2007, to focus on social activism and writing. She has written several books, and runs the India Vision Foundation. During 2008-11, she also hosted a court show AAP Ki Kacheri. She was one of the key leaders of the 2011 Indian anti-corruption movement, and joined the Bharatiya Janata Party in January 2015. She unsuccessfully contested the 2015 Delhi Assembly election as the party's chief ministerial candidate. On the 22nd of May 2016, Betty was appointed as the Lieutenant Governor of Puducherry. <laughs> Early life and education Betty was born on 9 June 1949 in Amritsar, in a well-to-do Punjabi business family. She is the second child of Prakash Lal Peshawariya and Prem Lada she has three sisters, Shushi, Rita and Anu. Her great-great-grandfather Lala Hargobind had migrated from Peshawar to Amritsar, where he set up a business. Betty's upbringing was not very religious, but she was brought up in both Hindu and Sikh traditions her grandmother was a Sikh. Prakash Lal helped with the family's textile business, and also played tennis. Betty's grandfather Muni Lal controlled the family business, and gave an allowance to her father. He cut this allowance when Betty's elder sister Shushi was enrolled in the Sacred Heart Convent School, Amritsar. Although the school was 16 kilometers away from their home, Shushi's parents believed it offered better education than other schools. Muni Lal was opposed to his grandchild being educated in a Christian school. However, Prakash Lal declared financial independence, and went on to enroll all his daughters, including Kiran, in the same school. Betty started her formal studies in 1954, at the Sacred Heart Convent School in Amritsar. She participated in National Cadet Corps among other extracurricular activities. At that time, Sacred Heart did not offer science, instead, it had a subject called household, which was aimed at grooming girls into good housewives. When she was in class 9, Betty joined Cambridge College, a private institute that offered science education and prepared her for matriculation exam. By the time her former schoolmates at Sacred Heart cleared class 9, she cleared class 10 matriculation exam. Betty graduated in 1968, with a B.A. Honors in English, from Government College for Women at Amritsar. The same year, she won the NCC Cadet Officer Award. In 1970, she obtained a master's degree in political science from Punjab University, Chandigarh. From 1970 to 1972, Betty taught as a lecturer at Khalsa College for Women in Amritsar. She taught courses related to political science. Later, during her career in the Indian Police Service, she also earned a law degree at Delhi University in 1988 and a PhD from IIT Delhi's Department of Social Sciences in 1993.
Topic: Tennis career. Inspired by her father, Betty started playing tennis at the age of nine. As a teenage tennis player, she cut her hair short as they interfered with her game. In 1964, she played her first tournament outside Amritsar, participating in the National Junior Lawn Tennis Championship at Delhi Gymkhana. She lost in early rounds, but won the trophy two years later, in 1966. As the national champion, she was eligible for entry to the Wimbledon Junior Championship, but was not nominated by the Indian administration. Between 1965 and 1978, Betty won several tennis championships, including Betty was also a part of Indian team that beat Sri Lanka to win the Lionel Fonseca Memorial Trophy in Colombo. She continued playing tennis until the age of 30, when she started focusing on her Indian police service career. In 1972, she married fellow tennis player Raj Betty. The two had met on service club courts in Amritsar. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Indian police service career. As a young woman, Betty frequented the service club in Amritsar, where interaction with senior civil servants inspired her to take up a public service career. On 16 July 1972, Betty started her police training at the National Academy of Administration in Missouri. She was the only woman in a batch of 80 men, and became the first woman IPS officer. After a six-month foundation course, she underwent another nine months of police training at Mount Abu in Rajasthan, and further training with Punjab police in 1974. Based on a draw, she was allocated to the Union Territory Cadre now called a GMUT or Arunachal Pradesh Goa Mizoram Union Territories Cadre. <laughs> First posting in Delhi Betty's first posting was to the Chanakyapuri subdivision of Delhi in 1975. The same year, she became the first woman to lead the all-male contingent of the Delhi police at the Republic Day Parade in 1975. Her daughter Sukriti later Sina, was born in September 1975. Chanakyapuri was an affluent area that included the parliament building, foreign embassies, and the residences of the Prime Minister and the President. The crimes in the area were mainly limited to minor thefts, but political demonstrations which sometimes turned violent were a regular occurrence. During the 1970s, there were many clashes between Niran Kari and Akali Sikhs. On 15 November 1978, a group of Niran Karis held a congregation near India Gate. A contingent of 700 to 800 Akalis organized a demonstration against them. DCP Betty's platoon was deployed to stop the protesters and prevent violence. As the protesters resorted to brick batting, Betty charged them with a cane, although there was no tear gas squad to support her unit. One of the demonstrators ran towards her with a naked sword, but she charged him as well as other demonstrators with a cane. Ultimately, her unit was able to disperse the demonstrators. For this action, Betty was awarded the President's Police Medal for Gallantry 1979. In October 1980, in 1979, Betty was posted to Delhi's West District, where there were not enough officers to handle the high volume of criminal activity. To compensate, she started recruiting civilian volunteers. Each village in the district was night patrolled by six civilians led by an armed policeman. She enabled anonymous reporting of any knowledge about crimes. She clamped down on bootlegging and the illicit liquor business to reduce crimes in the area. Betty implemented an open-door policy, which encouraged citizens to interact with her. She implemented a beat box system, a complaint box was installed in each ward, and the beat constables were instructed to have their lunch near this box at a set time each day. She regularly asked people if they knew about the beat constable assigned to their area, and also walked with the constables to raise their self-esteem. Within three months, there was a reduction in crimes. There was a drop in cases related to Eve teasing, sexual harassment of women, and wife beating. This gained her the goodwill of local women, who also volunteered their services to help fight crime in the area. In October 1981, Betty was made DCP traffic. The preparation for the 1982 Asian Games had caused traffic snarls in the city. The construction of 19 sports stadiums and several flyovers had resulted in a number of blockades and diversions. Betty encouraged coordination between the Municipal Corporation of Delhi, Delhi Electric Supply Undertaking and Delhi Development Authority. 
She clamped down on errant motorists with a heavy hand. She replaced Chalons traffic tickets with spot fines. Her team towed improperly parked vehicles using six tow trucks, cranes, for traffic control. This earned her the nickname, Crane Betty. On 5 August 1982, an ambassador car DHI belonging to Prime Minister office was towed away by Sub-Inspector Nirmal Singh, as it was wrongly parked outside the Yusufzai market at Connaught Place. Singh was fully supported by Betty and her superior Ashok Tandon. To raise funds for traffic guidance materials, Betty presented Asian Games Traffic Management Plan to a group of sponsors. The sponsors committed to providing road safety and other educational material worth 3,500,000 rupees. She also bought traffic police jeeps for her officers. For the first time, four wheelers were allocated to inspectors in the traffic unit. After the Asian Games were over, she was given Asian Jodi Award for Excellence. She refused to accept the award for herself alone, and recommended that it be given to entire traffic unit. Betty did not spare errant motorists from the rich and influential section of the society, which resulted in a powerful lobby against her. Her victims included the director of the Central Bureau of Investigation and her own sister-in-law. After the Asian Games were over, she was transferred to Goa for three years. According to contemporary rumors, Indira Gandhi's aides R. K. Dewan and Yashpal Kapoor, as well as her yoga instructor Durendra Brahmachari, whom Betty had personally fined for a wrongly parked car, played a role in her transfer. According to another theory, the loss of revenue resulting from her experiment of holding classes for traffic violators instead of finding them was a major factor in her transfer. Her seven-year-old daughter suffered from nephritic syndrome since the age of three, and was seriously ill at the time. Betty requested the Home Ministry to not to transfer her out of Delhi until her daughter's condition became stable. According to Betty, she had put herself in a very vulnerable situation, and the only people who could help her were the ones who had been offended by my equal enforcement of law. Her request was not entertained, and she had to leave behind her daughter, who was too ill to accompany her. Goa. Betty arrived in Goa in March 1983, on a three-year assignment. A few months after her arrival, the Zuari Bridge was completed but not open to public. The state government wanted Indira Gandhi to come from Delhi and inaugurate it formally. However, they were not able to secure confirmation from Indira Gandhi for several days. The public had to use ferries to transfer their vehicles across the Zuari River. One day, during a patrol, Betty noticed that there was a huge mass at the ferry boarding point. She drove to the bridge, removed the blockades and diverted the traffic waiting at ferry to the bridge. This unofficial inauguration angered many politicians. In November 1983, Goa hosted the Commonwealth Heads of Government Meet Betty involved NCC cadets in Goa for traffic regulation along the VIP routes. Shortly after the CHOGM ended, her daughter's medical condition worsened. Betty applied for leave, so that she could go to Delhi and take care of her daughter. Until this point, she had not taken privilege leave in her decade-long career, and her leaves had always lapsed. Inspector General of Police IGP Rajendra Mohan recommended her leave application, but the leave was not officially sanctioned by the Goa government. Betty left for Delhi anyway, since she had enough leaves in her account. Her daughter was hospitalized at AIIMS for one week. After her daughter was discharged from hospital, Betty decided to stay in Delhi until her recovery. Betty sent a personal letter to the IGP, as well as a detailed explanation to the Goa government, with medical reports and certificates. However, in a statement to United News of India UNI, the Goa Chief Minister Pratap Singh Rain declared her absconding and absent without leave. After seeing Betty's daughter's condition in Delhi, UNI published a rebuttal to the Chief Minister's statement. This made Goa government even more hostile to Betty. Topic. Back to Delhi After being declared absent without sanctioned leave, Betty was not given any assignment for six months. When her daughter's condition became stable, she met the Union Home Secretary T. N. Chaturvedi, who reinstated her. She was assigned to the Railway Protection Force in New Delhi, as a deputy commandant. Six months later, after appealing to a senior official in Prime Minister's office, she was reassigned to the Department of Industrial Development, as a deputy director. 
There, she worked under the Directorate General of Industrial Contingency DGIC, as a strike mediator between labor and management. Betty left DGIC in October 1985, and shortly after her departure, the organization was wound up as part of an economy drive. In 1985, Police Commissioner Ved Marwa made a special request for Betty to be assigned to the police headquarters. There, Betty cleared several pending files and sanctioned 1,600 promotions in a single day to motivate the staff. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Campaign against drugs. In 1986, Betty became DCP of Delhi's North District, where the primary problem was drug abuse. At that time, Delhi had only one center for treatment of drug addicts, Ashiana, which was run by the New Delhi Municipal Corporation. With help from her superiors, Betty set up a detox center in one of the police premises. The center relied on community donations of furniture, blankets, medicines and other supplies. It also received voluntary services from doctors and yoga teachers. Within a year, five more detox centers were set up. Each center was intended to serve up to 30 patients, but at one time, each center catered to around 100 patients. The initiative was widely noticed, and Betty traveled all over India, giving presentations and lectures on the program. Before she was transferred to a new post, she and 15 other police officers institutionalized the detox centers as Navjoti Police Foundation for Correction, De Addiction and Rehabilitation. Betty served as the General Secretary of the Foundation. Lawyers <laughs> 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 strike <laughs> 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 In the 1980s, Betty attracted ire of Delhi politicians and lawyers. First, she ordered Lathi charge on a Bharatiya Janata Party BJP assembly in Red Fort area, and arrested its leaders. A few months later, she arrested Congress I MPJP. Agarwal for violating curfew orders. In January 1988, the Delhi police caught a man stealing from a girl's purse at St. Stephen's College. A few weeks later, he was arrested again for trespassing into a women's toilet and writing obscene graffiti inside. One of Betty's officers arrested and handcuffed the man. When he was produced in the court, he was recognized as Rajesh Agnihotri, a lawyer practicing at the Tiz Hazari Courts Complex. The man had given a different name when he was arrested, and his lawyer colleagues claimed that he had been falsely framed. The protesters also argued that lawyers must not be handcuffed even if there are proper grounds for their arrest. Betty vociferously defended her officer's action. The lawyers organized a strike and led a procession to DCP North office. Not finding DCP Betty at the office, the lawyers manhandled additional DCP Sandhu. This led to a scuffle between the cops and the lawyers. The lawyers escalated their strike, and several politicians supported the lawyers in demanding suspension of Betty. On 21 January, the police Lathi charged the striking lawyers in Tiz Hazari complex. This further enraged the lawyers. On 17 February, a mob of an estimated 600 1,000 people led by the Congress corporator Rajesh Yadav arrived at Tiz Hazari court. The mob was armed with brickbats, hockey sticks and small rods. It raised slogans in support of Betty and Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. It stoned the lawyers' chambers and smashed the windscreens of their cars. The police force deployed in the area did not try to stop the mob violence, although some individual policemen tried to control the mob. Betty denied any connivance in the incident. The police later arrested Rajesh Yadav, and charged him with rioting and conspiracy. The Congress distanced itself from Yadav and ousted him. For the next two months, the lawyers stopped courts from functioning in Delhi and neighboring states, demanding Betty's resignation. The strike was called off after the Delhi High Court constituted a two-judge committee to investigate the matter. Known as WADA Commission, the committee consisted of Justice D. P. WADA and Justice N. N. Goswami. K. K. Venugopal, the lawyers' counsel, produced evidence that on 17 February, all police stations in the zone knew that a 2,000-strong mob was heading towards Tiz Hazari Courts Complex, where the lawyers were on a hunger strike. Despite this, no police force was deputed to protect them. In its interim report, the commission expressed concern over police lapses. The judges said that they wanted to investigate the matter further, and recommended transfer of five police officers including Betty out of North Delhi, during the investigation period. 
Even before the report was made public, in April 1988, the Union government transferred Betty to the post of Deputy Director Operations in the Narcotics Control Bureau NCB, also in Delhi. Two days later, the four other officers mentioned in the report were also transferred. The members of the Delhi Bar Association were not satisfied with Betty's transfer, and wanted her suspended. However, the police commissioner Ved Marwa refused to suspend Betty. The commission's final report, released in April 1990, censured all the parties. The report stated that the arrest of Rajesh Agnihotri was justified, but his handcuffing was illegal. It also concluded that an indiscriminate and unjustified Lathi charge on the lawyers was ordered by Betty, and that she had connived with the municipal councillor to organize the mob attack on the lawyers. The scholarly legal commentary was divided, with some supporting Betty, citing her unblemished service record. Mizoram After Betty was censured by the WADA Commission, it was decided to transfer her out of Delhi. She wanted a challenging posting in either Andamans, Arunachal Pradesh or Mizoram. She hoped that this would lead to her reassignment to Delhi police after a few years after hard postings. Government servants are unofficially entitled to a post they desire. She requested Joint Secretary Union Territories to transfer her to Mizoram, a remote border state in northeast India. When she didn't get any firm response, she wrote to the Home Secretary Naresh Kumar. Along with Betty's batchmate Parminder Singh, Naresh Kumar convinced the Joint Secretary to transfer her to Mizoram. They pointed out that officers who were given Mizoram posting refused to go there, while Betty was volunteering to go there. Betty reported to the Mizoram government in Aizal on 27 April 1990. Her designation was Deputy Inspector General range. Her parents and her daughter also moved to Mizoram. Consumption of alcohol, especially home brewed rice liquor zoo, was very common in Mizoram. Several of Betty's officers were alcoholics. At first, she didn't stop them since zoo was a part of Mizo culture, and she didn't want to be seen as someone who interfered with the local culture. Later, she opened an indoor de addiction facility for alcoholic policemen. The major crime in the district was heroin smuggling across the Burmese border. A number of teenagers were drug addicts, with proxivon and heroin being the most common drugs. Most of the repeat criminal offenders were alcoholic. Since Mizoram was a Christian-majority state, Betty utilized Christian prayers to reduce drug and alcohol-induced criminal behavior. She declared Saturday's prayer and rehabilitation day at district police stations, despite protests from the superintendent of police, who was an atheist. Every Saturday, past criminals would be brought to the police station to pray and learn and to receive treatment for alcoholism. While in Mizoram, she completed a major part of her PhD research. Later, in September 1993, she was awarded a doctorate by IIT Delhi's Department of Social Sciences for her thesis on drug abuse and domestic violence. During her stay in Mizoram, she also started writing her autobiography. In September 1992, her daughter Sukriti applied for a seat in Lady Hardinge Medical College Delhi, under a quota for Mizoram residents. Students of Mizoram launched a violent agitation against the allocation, on the grounds that she was a non-Mizo. Sukriti had topped the merit list with 89% marks, and was given seat from the central pool, according to the government guidelines. Mizoram's chief minister Lal Thanhala asked her to surrender the seat in the larger interests of the state. Although he accepted that, there was nothing illegal in her daughter getting the seat. Betty refused to surrender the seat, saying that her daughter deserved the seat. As the protests turned violent, Betty received threats that her house would be set on fire. Her superiors told her that they could no longer protect her. She left Izal after submitting her leave application. Her parents and daughter had already left for Delhi by this time. Lal Thanhala accused her of insubordination. As Delhi Prisons Inspector General After leaving her Mizoram assignment incomplete in September 1992, Betty had to wait eight months for a new posting. In May 1993, she was posted to the Delhi Prisons as Inspector General IG. The Tihar Jail of Delhi was built as a four-jail complex with a capacity of 2,500 prisoners. However, by the time Betty became its in charge, its prisoner population varied from 8,000 to 9,500. 
About 90% of its inmates were under trials, who had been accused of non-bailable offenses. Some of them had been waiting for years to get a trial in a badly clogged court system. The prison had a budget of 15 crore rupees, which was just enough to pay for basic expenditure, leaving little for welfare programs. Tihar was notorious as a violent and unmanageable place, and no officer wanted to be posted there. The post had been lying vacant for nine months. Before Betty was posted there, Betty decided to turn Tihar into a model prison. She introduced several reforms. She arranged separate barracks for the hardened criminals, who had been using their time in prison to recruit gang members, sell contraband and extort money. These prisoners unsuccessfully challenged Betty in court for unfairly segregating them. For other prisoners, Betty arranged vocational training with certificates, so that they could find a job after their release. During her tenure, Indira Gandhi National Open University and National Open School set up their centers inside the prison. Legal cells were set up to help the under trials. Betty banned smoking in the prison. The move faced a lot of resistance from the staff as well as the prisoners. She introduced yoga and vipassana meditation classes to change the prisoners' attitudes. She organized additional activities such as sports, prayer, and festival celebrations. She also established a de addiction center, and pulled up or imprisoned the staff members involved in drug supply. A bank was also opened inside the prison. A bakery and small manufacturing units, including carpentry and weaving units, were set up in the jail. The profits from the products sold were put into the prisoners' welfare fund. Betty went on daily prison tours, observing the staff, listening to prisoners' complaints, inspecting food quality and evaluating overall management. She developed a panchayat system, where prisoners who were respected for their age, education, or character represented other inmates and met every evening with senior officers to sort out problems. She also established petition boxes so that prisoners could write to the IG about any issue. While the jail had suggestion boxes earlier too, the jail staff would destroy the complaints received through these boxes. On the other hand, the prisoners writing to Betty received acknowledgement and information about the status of their petition. In this prison reform program, Betty involved outsiders, including NGOs, schools, civilians and former inmates. As a result of Betty's reforms, there was a drop in the fights and disturbances in the jail. Even the hardened criminals, who had been isolated in separate barracks, started behaving well. Betty then arranged for them to attend education and meditation courses. In May 1994, Betty organized a health day, during which around 400 doctors and paramedics were invited to attend to Tihar's patients. Based on visits to two of Tihar's adolescent wards, a cardiologist associated with the Delhi government's AIDS control program claimed that two thirds of the inmates had acknowledged engaging in homosexual acts. He recommended distribution of condoms in the prison, a move supported by Delhi's health minister Harsh Vardhan and National AIDS Control Organization. However, Kiran Bedi opposed the move pointing out that there were no HIV plus prisoners in Tihar. She stated that the distribution of condoms would encourage homosexual activity illegal as per section 377 among criminals. Based on a survey conducted through petition boxes, she claimed that incidence of consensual homosexual activity was negligible, and that the doctor's claim had hurt her prisoners. In response, the activist group ABVA filed a writ petition in the Delhi High Court demanding distribution of condoms in Tihar. Betty termed the move as an attempt to force Western solutions on Tihar Ashram and filed a counter affidavit opposing the demand. Topic. Removal from Tihar Betty's reform program at Tihar received worldwide acclaim. But it also attracted envy from her superiors, who accused her of diluting prison security for personal glory. She was not on good terms with her immediate supervisor in the government, the minister for prisons Harsharan Singh Bali. Many members of Bali's party, the BJP, had not forgiven Betty for her lathi charge on the party's assembly in the 1980s. However, until March 1995, Betty was on good terms with BJP's Delhi Chief Minister Maidan Lal Karana. Karana was a prisoner in Tihar during the emergency, and appreciated her work for prisoners. In 1994, Betty was awarded the Ramon Magsaysay Award and the Nehru Fellowship. The Magsaysay Foundation recognized her leadership and innovations in crime control, drug rehabilitation, and humane prison reform. The U.S. President Bill Clinton invited her to National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, D.C. 
When the Delhi government refused to let her accept the invitation, Betty lobbied with the Union Home Ministry to get the clearance. However, the Home Minister S.B. Chauvin declined the permission. Clinton repeated the invitation in 1995, and this time, Betty approached the media. The New York Times published a report stating that Several politicians and her superiors were feeling cut up with her assertive style and the success that followed her. Under pressure from the public and the media, Chauvin allowed Betty to attend the breakfast. However, this episode won her several detractors in the government. Sometime later, Betty was invited by the United Nations to discuss social reintegration of prisoners at the Copenhagen Social Summit. When the Delhi government refused to permit her, Betty met the Minister of State for Home Rajesh Pilot on 4 March 1995. The meeting got extended, because of which Betty had to cancel an appointment she had with the Chief Minister Karana. Pilot gave her the permission, but this irked Karana, who later exclaimed, If she thinks we have no importance, then why does she want to work for the Delhi government? While Betty was in Copenhagen, the prominent farmers' leader Mahendra Singh Takait was imprisoned in Tihar after a rally, and sought the BJP leader's help in getting a hookah inside. However, the jail authorities refused to give permission for a hookah, since Betty had earlier declared Tihar a no-smoking zone. Subsequently, Delhi's Lieutenant Governor P.K. Dave wrote a letter to the Union Home Secretary K. Padmanabia, accusing Betty of manipulating foreign trips, and leveled other charges against her. Dave accused Betty of compromising the prison's security by allowing visitors, including American officials and foreign TV crews, inside the jail, without the Delhi government's permission. Another charge was that she had allowed NHRC representatives to meet Tata detainees from Kashmir, who had raised anti-national slogans. In her defense, Betty argued that the Tata detainees had gone on a relay hunger strike demanding speedy trials. She also stated that the foreign TV crews had only shot the Vipassana meditation classes, and that she had the right to admit them under the rules. She also pointed out that the Union government had itself asked her to allow the Americans, Lee P. Brown and Christine Wisner, wife of Frank G. Wisner inside the prison. Another charge against Betty was giving undue favors to the notorious criminal Charles Sabraj. At that time, the Delhi Jail Manual written in 1894 and modified in 1988 listed a number of prohibited articles, one of which was a typewriter. However, the manual also gave the jail superintendent the power to allow any of these prohibited items in special cases. Using this power, Betty permitted Sabraj the use of an electronic typewriter Sabraj had already been given a manual typewriter before Betty became the officer in charge. Betty had also allowed NGOs to start typing classes for prisoners, but Sabraj claimed that he was using the typewriter to write her biography, which gave the authorities a reason to accuse Betty of misusing her powers. Karana also alleged that Sabraj had been supplied with a pipe and foreign-made cigars, a charge refuted by the testimony of Sabraj's former cellmate. The prison manual also had an antiquated rule which stated that, "...caught escapees will wear a red cap." Sabraj had escaped in 1986, before he was recaptured. Karana alleged that Betty had specially exempted him from wearing a red cap. However, a senior jail officer stated that he had never seen the red cap rule being implemented in Tihar. P.K. Dave and Maiden Lal Karana got Betty removed as the prisons in charge on 3 May 1995. When her transfer was announced, the Tihar inmates went on a hunger strike to protest it, while some of the warders celebrated it by distributing sweets. Betty accused, "...unethical politicians," of, "...telling lies, making false allegations and misinforming people." She alleged that her supervisors in the government had no, "...interest, vision or leadership." She argued that she should not have been transferred on the basis of unverified charges, and demanded an inquiry committee. Rajesh Pilot defended her publicly, but the Union government did not officially support her. Kushwant Singh described her transfer as, "...a victory for a handful of small-minded, envious people over a gutsy woman." <laughs> After Tihar After her removal from Tihar, Betty was posted as head of training at the police academy on 4 May 1995. Her designation was Additional Commissioner Policy and Planning. She served as the Joint Commissioner of Police of Delhi Police. Later, she served as the Special Commissioner Intelligence of Delhi Police. 
On 5 April 1999, she was appointed as Inspector General of Police in Chandigarh. Her mother accompanied her, but soon suffered a stroke and went into coma. Betty requested a transfer back to Delhi, where her family would be able to take care of her mother. The Union Ministry of Home Affairs transferred her back to Delhi on 15 May. However, her mother died in Delhi three days later, after having been in coma for 41 days. In 2003, Betty became the first woman to be appointed the United Nations Civilian Police Advisor. She worked in the Department of Peacekeeping Operations. In 2005, she returned to Delhi after her UN stint. The Delhi Bar Association lobbied to ensure that she didn't get a post that would put her on track to become Delhi's police chief. The lawyers, who had still not forgiven Betty for the 1988 controversy, wrote to government authorities arguing that Betty's appointment to a top post might "...unnecessarily create a conflict between the legal fraternity and the police." She was made the Director General, Home Guards. Before her retirement, she was serving as the Director General of the Bureau of Police Research and Development. In 2007, Betty applied for the post of Delhi Police Commissioner. She was overlooked in favor of Yudhvir Singh Dadwal, who was junior to her, reportedly because the senior bureaucrats saw her as too outspoken and radical. Betty alleged bias, and stated that her merit had been overlooked. She also proceeded for a three-month protest leave, but cancelled it later. Journalists like Karen Thapar and Pankaj Vora criticized her for crying bias, and stated that her service record was tainted with controversies like incomplete Goa, Mizoram, and Chandigarh assignments, the lawyers' strike controversy, and the removal from Tihar. Betty resigned from police service in November 2007, citing personal reasons. She stated that she wanted to focus on academic and social work. Topic social activism The Navjoti Delhi Police Foundation founded by Betty and her colleagues was renamed to Navjoti India Foundation in 2007. Since its establishment, the foundation received strong support from the local communities, as well as several Indian and foreign charitable trusts and government bodies. Over next 25 years, it provided residential treatment to nearly 20,000 drug and alcohol addicts. It also started crime prevention programs such as education of street children and slum kids. It established 200 single teacher schools, vocational training centers, health care facilities and counseling centers for the vulnerable sections of society. In 2010, it also established the Navjoti Community College, affiliated to IGNOW. Betty set up India Vision Foundation IVF in 1994. IVF works in fields of police reforms, prison reforms, women empowerment and rural and community development. In police reform area, Betty emphasized better training, while opposing hazing of trainees. She opposed frequent transfers, stating that these lead to poor cadre management. She also proposed creation of a new level of police administration, which would protect rank and file officers from politicians and bureaucrats. In women's rights area, she has advocated equitable educational opportunities and property ownership including co-ownership for women. She has emphasized faster empowerment of rural women. She is a social commentator and trainer and frequently speaks on various social issues like education, domestic violence and others. During 2008-11, Betty hosted the reality TV show AAP Ki Kacheri on Star Plus. In this court show, Betty resolved everyday conflicts in a simulated courtroom. In 2008, she launched the website http www.saferindia.com slash kiranbetty slash to help people whose complaints are not accepted by the local police. In 2010, she was invited as speaker in Washington by TEDx. Anti-corruption movement. In October 2010, Arvind Kejriwal invited Betty to join him in exposing the CWG scam. Betty accepted the invitation, and by 2011, the two had allied with other activists, including Anna Hazare, to form India Against Corruption IAC group. Their campaign evolved into the 2011 Indian anti-corruption movement. Anna Hazare planned an indefinite hunger strike to demand the passage of a stronger Jan Lokpal bill in the Indian parliament. On 16 August 2011, Betty and other key members of IAC were detained by the police, four hours before the hunger strike could start. Betty and other activists were released later on the same day. 
After 12 days of protests and many discussions between the government and the activists, the parliament passed a resolution to consider three points in drafting of Lokpal bill. Some members of parliament proposed to bring a breach of privilege motion against Betty and other activists for allegedly mocking the parliamentarians during the Lokpal bill protests. However, they withdrew these notices later. During the anti-corruption movement, Betty faced controversy when some newspapers questioned discrepancies in her past travel expenses between 2006 and 2011. In 2009, for example, Betty was invited as the keynote speaker at a conference arranged by Aviation Industry Employees Guild. She accepted the invitation without a speaking fee, but her NGO was to be reimbursed for travel expenses. Betty's travel agent Flywell, invoiced her host's business class fare for air tickets, but arranged Betty to travel in economy class. Between 2006 and 2011, there were several discrepancies in travel-related expense statements, as well as instances where she traveled at no cost to her hosts for a cause. In these cases, Betty stated she did not personally receive or incur the disputed difference, only India Vision Foundation did, an NGO she headed. In November 2011, the Delhi Police, under directions of the additional Chief Metropolitan Magistrate, registered an FER, police case for cognizable offence, against Betty for allegedly misappropriating funds through Indian Vision Foundation and other NGOs. The investigation that followed found no evidence of fraud against her or of siphoning of NGO funds for personal use, and subsequently filed closure of the case. Politics Betty split from IAC after a faction led by Arvind Kejriwal formed the AAM Admi Party in 2012. AAP went on to form a short-lived minority government in Delhi with Kejriwal as Chief Minister during the 2014 Indian general election, Betty publicly supported Narendra Modi, the prime ministerial candidate of Bharatiya Janata Party BJP. Kejriwal, on the other hand, contested the election against Modi. After Modi won and became the Prime Minister of India, Betty stated that she was ready to be BJP's CM candidate in Delhi, if such an offer was made to her. Eight months after Modi's election, she joined BJP in 2015. She was BJP's Chief Minister CM candidate for the 2015 Delhi Assembly elections, in which Arvind Kejriwal was AAP's CM candidate. She lost the election from Krishna Nagar constituency to AAP candidate S. K. Baga by a margin of 2,277 votes, and AAP came to power again with an absolute majority after one year. On the 22nd of May 2016, Betty was appointed as the Lieutenant Governor of Puducherry. Topic as an author Betty has authored the following works: Kiran Betty, 1985. Demand for Swaraj, 1905 to 1930. Abs, Kiran Betty 2006. It's Always Possible, One Woman's Transformation of Tihar Prison. Himalayan Institute Press. ISBN 978-0-89389-258-6, translated into Marathi as Itza Olaveha Pasabala ISBN 8177663538. Kiran Betty, Parminder Jeet Singh, Sandeep Srivastava 2001. Government at Net, New Governance Opportunities for India. SAGE. ISBN 978-0-7619-9569-2. Kiran Betty, 2003. As I See. Sterling. ISBN 978-81-207-2938-4. Kiran Betty, T. M. Doc, the 1st of January 2005. What Went Wrong? And Continues. UBSPD. ISBN 978-81-7476-444-7, translated into Marathi by Lina Sohoni as Vota Ventaranga, ISBN 8177664700, Kiran Betty 2006. It's Always Possible, One Woman's Transformation of Tihar Prison. Himalayan Institute Press. ISBN 978-0-89389-258-6. Kiran Betty, 2006. Galti Kiski in Hindi. Diamond. ISBN 978-81-7182-899-9. Kiran Betty, 2006. Yeha Sambhav Hai in Hindi. Diamond. 
ISBN 978-81-288-0466-3. Kieran Betty, 2008. Empowering Women. As I See, by Kieran Betty. Sterling. ISBN 978-81-207-9126-8, translated into Marathi by Madhuri Shanbhag as Aaya Iasc, Striyans Saksamikarana ISBN 8177664817, Kiran Kiran Bedi Leadership and Governance. As I See, by Kiran Bedi. Sterling. ISBN 978-81-207-9168-8, translated into Marathi by Madhuri Shanbhag as Ija Isc, Netartva Ani Prasasana ISBN 8177664817, Kiran Bedi 2008. Indian Police. As I See. Sterling. ISBN 978-81-207-3790-7, translated into Marathi by Madhuri Shanbhag as Aaya Isc, Bharatiya Polisa Siva ISBN 8177664817, Kiran Bedi, Pavan Choudhury 2010. Broom and Groom. Wisdom Village. ISBN 978-93-80710-01-3, translated into Hindi as Kayad K. Fayyad ISBN 9789380710017, Kiran Bedi 2007. translated into Gujarati as Avo Apain Sabyata Kelavi ISBN ISBN 9789380710017 Kiran Bedi. Be the Change, Fighting Corruption. Sterling. P. 2012. ISBN 978 81 207 9174 9. Kiran Bedi. Dare to Do, for the New Generation. Wisdom Village. ISBN 9789381438. Kiran Bedi. 2013. Uprising 2011, Indians Against Corruption. Wisdom Village Publications. ISBN 978-93-80710-44-0. Kiran Bedi, 2016. Dr. Kiran Bedi, Creating Leadership. Diamond Books Publications ISBN 978-93-51659-78-5. Kiran Bedi, 2016. Himmet High Kiran Bedi Diamond Books Publication. ISBN 978-81-7182-991-0. Personal life Kiran Bedi along with three of her sisters were born to the family of Prakash Lal Peshawariya and Prem Lata Peshawariya. She met her future husband Bridge Bedi on tennis courts of Amritsar. Bridge, who was nine years older than her, played university-level tennis at the time. On 9 March 1972, the two married at a simple ceremony at the local Shivalaya temple. The two have lived separately for most of their married life. The couple had a daughter in 1975, originally named Sukriti, she later changed her name to Saina. <laughs> <laughs> Awards and recognitions In 2005, CUNY School of Law awarded her an honorary Doctor of Law degree in recognition of her. Humanitarian Approach to Prison Reforms and Policing. The Navjoti Delhi Police Foundation received the 1999 Serge Sodorov Memorial Award for Outstanding Contributions to International Drug Control Efforts. <laughs> <laughs> Documentaries and biographies The following films, documentaries, and TV programs are based on Betty's life. Kartivam 1990, is a Telugu film based on Betty. It was dubbed into Tamil as Vijayanthi IPS. The movie was remade in Hindi as Tiazwini. 
Doing Time, Doing Vipassana 1997, documents Betty's initiatives for the practice of Vipassana meditation at Tihar I. Gandhi's Fotspor, In Gandhi's Footsteps, Kiran Betty's Humanitarian Revolution 2004, a documentary by the Norwegian filmmaker Oyston Rackins. Awarded Best Documentary at the Indo-American Film Festival in Atlanta in 2006. Kieran Betty, Yes Madam, Sir, 2008, a documentary produced by Australian filmmaker Megan Doneman. Narrated by Helen Mirren it was filmed over a six-year period and premiered in 2009. It was adjudged the Best Documentary at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. Kannadatta Kiran Betty 2009, is a Kannada film, starring Malashri as a fictionalized interpretation of Betty. Carve Your Destiny, a 2014 film directed by Anubhav Srivastava, features Betty. Biographies of Betty include Parmesh Dongwal, 1996. Punjabi D. Daler Dhi, Kiran Betty in Punjabi. Abhishek. Meenakshi Saxena, 2000. Kiran Betty, The Kindly Baton. Books India International. p. 232. Parmesh Dongwal, 2004. I Dare, Kiran Bedi, A Biography. UBS. ISBN 978-81-7476-483-6, translated into Sinhalese as Parmesh Dongwal, 2004. Man Bayana. Samayavardana Padala. ISBN 978-955-570-325-3. Siddharth Iyer, 2012. Kiran Bedi, The Woman of Substance. Diamond. ISBN 978-93-5083-669-9. Rita Peshawariya Menon and Anu Peshawariya, 2014. Kiran Bedi, Making of Top Cop. Diamond. ISBN 9789351653. Kiran Bedi, The Woman of Substance. Diamond. ISBN 9781353. A 32-page comic book biography authored by Kiran Bedi's sisters Rita and Anukiran Bedi was featured in National Geographic's series, Mega Icons, 2018, which revolves around the life of her.